I change up the intro a little bit this morning. Some of the scriptures we'll be looking at. Thank you, musicians, for the music this morning. If you got your uh, Bible with you, and I hope you do, would you turn with me to? We'll be looking at Matthew 16 and John chapter 18 here in a few minutes. Give you a little head start. Before we get too far this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning thanking you for allowing us to be here in your house. God, as we go into this time of your word, I pray God that you'll speak to our hearts as you see fit. Uh, bring conviction, bring adjustments, whatever we need, Father, and give us the boldness and the willingness to accept and take action. On the Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, I have a uh, simple and short message for you this morning. Um, as we've been going through the life of Christ in between Christmas and Easter, as I've said plenty of times before, and we're drawing real nigh to the Easter season, and, and we're getting close. And so we're coming to the point this morning, as we just listened to in the video of, of John at chapter 18, of, uh, of just the, the cusp of the time when, when Jesus was uh, betrayed. And captured. We find ourselves there uh, in the garden. He would be entering the hardest part of his life here on earth. Within about 12 hours, he would be tried, he would be beaten horrifically, he would be crucified, he would bear our sins on his shoulders, and he would die. In that short span of time. And he did it knowing that it would happen. Knowing that all this was coming. Knowing that it was all fixing to happen. The scripture tells us that he did. It says he knew all the things that were going to happen to him. It would be the natural human reaction to try to evade at all costs, wouldn't it? You see, our, our instinct, when, when we sense danger, our instinct screams at us. To avoid pain and stay alive, doesn't it? That, that's our natural way, that, that it's our, our self-defense mechanism from inside. And, and surely, being a man, Jesus had to have felt those same urges. The urges inside of him to, to avoid. And we see that a little bit in the, in the prayers that he spoke. But whereas an ordinary man would have run for his life, Jesus gave His. He gave it willingly. I want to, I want to, let's take a look into the garden this morning for just a few minutes and see what happened there and see that Jesus allowed it to happen willingly. And we can illustrate this for just a few minutes if, if, you'll, if you'll use your imagination with me. Think about what you would do if you think there's a chance that you're going to be attacked. All right, let's, let's think tactically for a few minutes. You, you think you're going to be in that, and you naturally would want to defend against that, to take every action that you can to protect yourself. What Jesus does, however, as we look here in the garden, shows that he did not try to avoid his capture at all. Not at all. Let's look here quickly at this. Number one thing I want you to see, what, what, what would you do? Perhaps you would gather your troops together. And make sure that they understand the danger, right? You would want your friends surrounding you and you want them to understand, hey, this is, the, this is what's going to happen and this is how we're going to guard against it, right? Well, let's, let's look in our scriptures this morning in Matthew chapter 16, if you're there. I'll put some on the screen here in a little while. But Matthew chapter 16, let's look in our Bible in verse 21.
It says, from that time forth, now this is, this is going to be a little prior to what we were listening to in John 18, and we'll be in, in just a few minutes. So a little bit prior to that. It says, from that time forth, Jesus began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. So he didn't keep it a secret from his disciples, did he? He told them plain and simple, this is what's going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to capture me. They're going to they're going to beat me and it's going to be suffering and I'm going to die, but I'm going to come back. All right. For some time, Jesus has been. We see other places in Scripture where he told them exactly that was what was going to But as you read this, doesn't it seem like they still didn't get it? The disciples, it didn't sink in. I think they were in a state of constant denial. You ever, you ever been there? When you, it's like when you clearly see the evidence of something but you want it to not be so, so bad that it's like your brain won't admit it. It's there and the evidence is right in front of it, but it just it won't sink in. I wonder if that's what was going on in the disciples' mind. See, it was not part of their plan for Jesus to die. They had been waiting for this and, and, and seeing in the Scriptures and hearing the teachers for years talk about the Messiah was coming and He was finally on the scene and He was doing the great miracles and the great things and they had plans and and then he was going to be the king and take over. His death wasn't part of their plan. It was still so much to be done. How many of you know that God's plans and your plans don't always line up? It doesn't happen that way all the time. And how many of you know that God's plan is the right plan? Every time. You see, the troops were gathered, but they still weren't ready. But Jesus let that go, didn't he? He told them, he told them, but they didn't get it. But he didn't, he didn't keep pounding it in their head. Because he knew one day they would look back. They would look back and they would understand what he was telling them. All right, so let's go to the next one. Number two, you don't want to let the enemy know that you're on to his plan. If you're in fear of getting attacked or ambushed or something, you don't, you don't go... You don't want to tell the, the enemy that, that you know and, and give away your security. See, but Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him, didn't he? There was no secret. You know, we, we've talked here recently about the, uh, how, how God knows everything that's going to happen. And it's issued, uh, illustrated here, if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 26 with me. Matthew chapter 26, look at 14 through 16. This is in Matthew's account of what we call the Last Supper, when Jesus and his disciples were gathered there sharing their, their last meal together, having the most awkward supper conversation ever, we'll see in just a second. Matthew chapter 26, 14 through 16, says, uh, um, <clears throat> Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest. This is just before the Last Supper. And he said unto them, what will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they uh, co-enchanted with him, uh, I mean covenanted for him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. So there's, there's the picture of Judas. He's, he's made the deal with the chief priest. And he's looking for an opportunity at this time to betray Jesus. All right, The deal has been done, and then we find him at the Last Supper here as we go down just a little bit to verse 21. They got together, they, they gathered together for the last supper. Verse, verse 21 says, And they, they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, one of you shall betray me. That's when it got awkward. Verse 22 said, They were exceeding sorrow and began every one of them to say, Lord, is it I? Now I have to wonder there, what was going through Judas's mind as they're going around? Can you imagine the scene? They're gathered around the table. They're all, you know, it, was, uh, it would have been the, the, their traditional table that was low and they were reclined around and then it was, it was large. So maybe they couldn't all hear each other real clearly, but they're going around saying, Lord, is it I? And, and I wonder if, if, if Judas was getting a little squirrely there as it's going around and they're all, is it I? And, you know, Jesus is not giving them a clear answer and he, he goes on and tells them it's the one that's going to 
dip in the in the dish with me. All right, but then you know I, I don't know. Let's see, go look because go twenty four and twenty five. Jesus said, "The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him." But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Jesus, I mean Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. So Jesus clearly pointed out, Judas is going to be the one to betray me, right in front of everybody. You ever wonder, if Jesus told him flat out that Judas would betray him, why didn't they do something about it? Why didn't the other disciples get up and, and, and do something and, and to, to stop this? You know, I don't know what the reason was in their mind, but it shows us something. In the very beginning of verse 24, let me read that again. It said, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. See, this was something that was going to happen. This was something that was planned out and determined long before. Uh, even the betrayal of Jesus was prophesied. Long ago, that this was going to happen. What happened here, or, or rather what did not happen here, what, what we don't see the disciples doing, illustrates to us that even if for some reason we wanted to disrupt God's plan because we think it's the right thing to do, we can't. We don't have that power to disrupt what God is going to do. What God has decreed will take place no matter what. And this was the decreed plan of God. And Jesus shows us that. Even, even when he pointed out and exposed Judas, and said, hey, you're the one that's going to betray me. And I don't know which of the other disciples heard that. It still did not disrupt the plan that God had. Now, number three, I want to show you the biggest rule of operational security. If you're worried about being uh, ambushed, is alter your schedule. All right? Never be in the same place at the same time twice. Because then the enemy can watch and they can pattern you and see where, you, where you're going, right? Well, go with me to the book of John. Let's turn over there. John chapter 18. Because I want to show you something interesting that, that Jesus did here. Bearing that in mind that if we knew somebody was looking for a chance to betray us and capture us, you know, we would maybe take that plan, right? It would be our, our desire to make that as difficult as we can. But in John chapter 18, look at verse 1 and 2. Scripture says, when Jesus had spoken those words, he went forth with the disciples over the brook Cedron, where there was a garden under which he entered, and his disciples. Now, just as a side note here, some, some things I was listening to this week were, were explaining what some of these gardens looked like. A lot of times they were walled in, private little gardens on the side of it, so there was a way in and a way out. All right, so first he goes into a place where he's going to be cornered. Now look at verse 2. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his, his disciples. So he went. Now, why did John take the time to point out that they went there often, do you think? You see, John is pointing out that Jesus is purposely going where Judas would know where to find him. He wasn't trying to avoid him. He wasn't trying to hide from him. He wasn't trying to evade. He went right where he has set up a pattern for some time. Hey, you know, in, when we're in this area in the evening, we're going to go over here into the, uh, to the garden to pray. And Judas knew right where to find him. Now, there's something that the world should take away from this. If we can just go for a thought for a second, Jesus isn't hiding, he's not hiding. We heard this, this term all the time, have you found Jesus? Have you ever, have you found Jesus? Look, he would be the worst at hide and seek, wouldn't he? Jesus would be, as soon as you start looking for him, he's like, here I am. In fact, the Bible tells us we wouldn't even, we would not even try to find him if he didn't reach out to us first. We love him because he first loved us. Jesus is not hiding. You know, but... Moving on, even after the ambush that, that we read about or we heard about on the scriptures just a little while ago, even after the ambush, Jesus could have escaped any time. Any time. Let's, let's back up and, and look at an example. Uh, flip a screen there, Miss Layla, for me. Forward one. Luke chapter 4, verse 28 through 30. This was a time 
earlier in the ministry when, when Jesus had got himself into a tight spot. Let's read this. He said, and all day in the synagogue when they heard about these things were filled with wrath. But Jesus had done something and stirred them up and rose up and thrust them out of the city and led them to the brow of the hill whereon the city was built that they might cast him down headlong. The, the throng had captured Jesus and took him out and they're about to throw him off the cliff, literally. But look at verse 30. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. <laughs> How did he do it? I don't know how he did it. I don't know what he did. If, they were, if he put them in a trance, maybe he altered his appearance. Somehow, Jesus had the power in the face of danger to just turn around and walk right out, and they could not do a thing about it. You know, yeah, I, I mentioned maybe he altered his appearance because sometimes he was known to do that, right? Remember, after the resurrection, we see a good example of it on the road to Emmaus when the, the two disciples are walking along and they're, they're sad and, the, and, and Jesus walks right up to them and he's talking with them and conversating, you know, and they knew well what Jesus looks like. They were disciples, but they didn't recognize him because for somehow Jesus made it where they could not recognize him. And then they went to a certain point and they sat down and he revealed himself for who he was. All right, so he had the power to do that. So here in the garden, when Judas and this throng of captors came to get him, Jesus could have just walked right out. Would have been his desire, but he didn't. And then we see, then we see what I think is one of the coolest displays of Jesus' power. Uh, so we go down in John chapter 18 here in our Bibles. Look at verses 4 through 6. This is just neat to me. It says, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? The, the throne has come up. All right. And he, and he sees. Now, let me stop right there. Imagine the scene the, the, the band of men, the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees and their hired guns and everybody that had come along. I, I was listening to a thing. You know, I always picture this as, as a few. But, uh, but, in fact, as, uh, as some scholars point out, we don't know. It doesn't say how many it was. But as there would have been a lot of the chief priests and, and the, their servants were there and their, their hired soldiers were there. Some of the Romans were probably there. And as they're going through with their torches and their weapons, uh, you know, we can see uh, other people gathering in with them and going, you know, some out of curiosity at this time they were all riled up and they're going to catch this criminal and, and the, so it could have been it could have been hundreds that showed up there to get Jesus we don't know all right despite how many there was what happened was really neat look at verse 5 he said they answered him Jesus of Nazareth and he saith unto him unto them and just we read this in just a plain voice I am he and Judas also which were, which betrayed him stood with them as soon as he said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Isn't that neat? I, I picture it like, you, you ever seen dominoes going down? Imagine that. A hundred uh, uh, of, uh, uh, you know, it looks to me, you remember the old Frankenstein movie when they're all coming looking for Frankenstein and they got the torches and, and pitchforks and stuff? That's the, the picture, the scene that I see. And Jesus said, I am he. And they said, to the ground. That's, that's power. That's power. Knocked back by the very voice of Jesus. And he did it for one reason. You ever think about this? Why, why would he do that? He showed them and he showed his friends that were with him. And he showed us that if they took him that night, it was only because he let it happen. Moving on in Matthew chapter 26, 53. Flip the, uh, the next slide there. Look at the words of Jesus here. He said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled that this must be? Now this is in Matthew's account of the, of the same things that are going on here, okay? Where, where Jesus says this. And there has been this discussion through the years. Does this mean 10,000 angels or 72,000 angels? <laughs> now, 
Jesus often made these grand overstatements to make a point. We see it all the way through Scripture, right? Now, could he get 72,000 angels if he needed them or wanted them? Of course he could. Absolutely. That was all inside of his power. But think about this for a second. If he was going to call angels to his rescue, how many would it take? I'm sure one could have done the job. All right. And even that is moot because he was God. He, was, he didn't need help. He could have revoked the very breath that he put into those people if he wanted to end that. But he didn't want them dead. He didn't want that to happen. And he didn't need any help from his entourage that was with him either. You see, these words that we read here just from uh, a minute ago, these were words uh, from the verse that he said to Peter right after Peter did this. Let's, in, in John chapter 18, look what, what Peter did, verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> said, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. All right? Now, Malchus was lucky that Peter was a fisherman and not a sword fighter, right? Because I'm sure that he wasn't aiming for his ear. That's just what he got. That's where he hit him. But what was Peter doing with a sword anyway? Just prior to where we've been reading here. Go to the next slide, Miss Layla. Look at this. He said unto them, but now he that had the purse, let him take it. And likewise his script. And he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. And in verse 38, he said, And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Peter had a sword because Jesus told him, You need to get some swords. What did they need swords for? Jesus was going to stop them from fighting with them. How much does Jesus know? Everything. Jesus knew what Peter would do, and he was going to squeeze in one more miracle before they took him. Now, Luke's gospel tells us that, that after this happened, that Jesus healed Malchus's ear. He put it back. Can you imagine? He cut his ear off, and Jesus put it back on. <laughs> I bet it was better than it was before he got it cut off. But I think Jesus was making a big statement here through Malchus. He said, he said, you come here to kill me, but I came here to heal you. That's the statement that Jesus makes. We reject him, but he brings healing. What a sad testimony that they couldn't see the opportunity that was right in front of them. You know, this whole thing was part of God's plan. John chapter 19, 10 and 11, flip that, Miss Layla. Then said Pilate to him, this is where Jesus, shortly after this, he ends up in front of the, uh, the Roman governor, Pilate. Then Pilate saith unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Because Jesus was there and Pilate's trying to question him. And Jesus is just, just being quiet, right? He says, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou that not that I have the power to crucify thee and I have the power to release thee? Look what Jesus told him. Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. <laughs> the only reason that any of this evil plan worked, the only reason that any of this happened is because God foreordained it to happen. Knowing exactly what each person would do, God had okayed the process. Because this is the way it had to happen. It's the way it had to take place. And I want to show you one more thing. None of his disciples took the fall with him. Not a single one. John chapter 18, where we've been reading in scriptures, in verse 8 and 9, says this. <clears throat> Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go after their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of them which thou hast gavest me, I lost none. Do I have one more slide up here, Miss Layla? Yeah, Matthew 26, 56. This is a, in Matthew's account of this. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. You see what happened there? Jesus took the focus off of them to allow them to go. They forsook him. They ran away, and that was okay with Jesus. You see, Jesus allowed them to be there to see the whole scene unfold, but he protected them 
from the danger. Even though they were numbered with them, they were well known to be the followers of Jesus. We see from Peter's experience the next morning, they were recognizable. People would see them and say, hey, I know, but weren't you with them? But God did not allow them to be harmed because they had a job to do. They were the ones that would carry the torch. They would organize the church. They would take the gospel to the world. You see, the encouraging thing that I want us to take from that is to know that until God's purpose for us is completed, nothing will happen to us that's not in His purpose. Not a single thing. Because He is able to keep that which we have committed unto Him. We are in His hands of protection, and He will not lose not one. The price that Jesus would pay, His life on the cross for our sins could only be paid by one man. It wasn't for the disciples to make that sacrifice. He was perfect. He was sinless. He was innocent. He was the one. The one that could do it. And He went willingly because His love for us was that great. He loved us so much that He would go through these terrible things and give His life us. He went into the worst part of his, think about this, he went into the worst part of his life to give us the opportunity to go into the best part of ours, a relationship with our God. As our musicians make their way forward this morning, I have to leave you with that question. Do you have that relationship with God that Jesus Christ willingly made the sacrifice to make available to us. What better day today than today to make that choice? Is there anything that you need to do business with God about? You need to pray. The altar's open. I'll be here to talk if you need to. Let's stand together sing this song of invitation.